Welcome to a tech moment on Cannabis Tech. I'm your host, Christina Etter. In this podcast, we talk about some of the exciting science and technology that's impacting and changing the cannabis and hemp industries. And if you've tuned into my podcast before, if you've read some of my articles, you know that I have a particular opinion about a certain cannabinoid that is starting to flood the market in some of these non-legal states, and that is revolving around Delta-8 and the synthetic THCs that are being produced and now sold on the commercial market. Now. Let me just clarify before we dive into the topic of the hour here, I'm not against the cannabinoid. However, there are some production processes and some things that we need to think about before we just turn a product loose for consumers. So to talk about this topic today, I am so excited to bring onto the show Dr. Christopher Hudala, who is the founder and chief science officer at Pro Verde Labs. And he has been finding some pretty incredible stuff that I feel like needs to be discussed in this industry. So Chris, welcome to the show and thanks so much for taking the time out of your day. Thanks you for having me. So like I said in the beginning, we're seeing this influx of new products. We're seeing all this stuff happen and I'm, I'm thrilled to have the conversation with you. But before we really kind of dive into the meat and potatoes here, why don't you give our listeners a little bit of background on yourself and you know, how did you get involved in testing these cannabis products? Sure. So I got my PhD in analytical chemistry and did about 30, 35 years of research in both industrial and academic uh, arenas. And right around the time in 2013, when Massachusetts, where I live, legalized medical marijuana, well, we made the case for mandated testing of cannabis to ensure safety. And with that mandate from the state of Massachusetts, I left my industry position. Uh, with an uh, analytical instrumentation vendor and started Proverty Laboratories. So since 2013, it's it's kind of been a bit of a rough ride, but it's uh, been always interesting. Boy, we have definitely seen things evolve since 2013, that is for certain. But uh, obviously, now we have the, the hemp industry getting involved in producing consumables. And it's not so much about the cannabinoids. We've learned a lot about the cannabinoids from the cannabis space, but we're learning that there's some production issues and there's some things going on in some of these products that maybe consumers aren't aware of. Um, before we get into that, let's discuss the what exactly is Delta-8. And I know that you've done some tests on, on the natural hemp plant. So let's talk about how how Delta-8 naturally occurs, because we know that it does, but the commercial products that we're seeing today are actually being synthesized. So let's talk about the, the natural form of Delta-8 first. Sure. Delta-8 is a, is a natural, it's thought to be a degradation product of Delta-9 THC. They're, they're cousins in, in some respects. They're molecular structures that are very similar. The Delta-8 versus Delta-9 is just the position at which the double bond occurs in the chemical structure. In the natural cannabis plant, it Delta-8 exists in very trace quantities, such low levels that it would take about 55,000 kilos of hemp to produce one kilo of a Delta-8 extract. So while it is theoretically possible to create a natural Delta-8 extract, the wholesale value for that would be about $500 million based on the concentration in the plant and the amount of work that would be required to isolate and purify that. That's just absolutely crazy. And you know, one of the things that we've talked about that, that I would love to touch on here is because it does occur in such small quantities in the plant and it's difficult to extract it, you know, at that level, where does the concern lie? Because I think the biggest concern we have is the fact that we know very little about Delta-8 in, in these higher quantities that we're seeing on the market today, right? Well, Delta-8 itself has been studied. It's been around since I think the first conversions from CBD actually were in the early 60s. Uh, Raphael Mishulam demonstrated that and actually has some IP around that. So it's not a new compound. It has been studied before. It's been studied for a certain amount of safety and efficacy. The therapeutic potential for Delta-8 is, is pretty intriguing. It has a lot of the same benefits of Delta-9, but without the uh, intense psychoactivity that's associated with Delta-9. So Delta-8 itself uh, is not really the concern. The problem for me is that this is being created synthetically. And when you think about 
synthetic chemistry, I think, well, who does synthetic, synthetic chemistry? Well, that would be the pharmaceutical industry. They have trained PhD chemists that are doing organic synthesis and uh, making these compounds. Delta-8, on the other hand, is being made in garages, and uh, there are some sophisticated operations, but typically the people who are producing this are not skilled organic chemists. In each case, we've tested thousands of these products, we see many, many of side reaction byproducts. So as a chemist, when I'm drawing on a chalkboard a chemical reaction, I draw A with an arrow going to B, so A goes to B. But that's a perfect world, but in reality, it's not a simple singular reaction. It's actually a series of parallel reactions where A goes to B, A goes to C, A goes to D, A goes to E. And so we see many, many side reactions that are occurring at the same time. This happens in the pharmaceutical realm as well. The side reactions or byproducts are are a known issue when producing pharmaceutical compounds. And so pharmaceutical companies have two choices on how to deal with these unintended synthetic reaction byproducts. They either remove them or they have to demonstrate that they are non-toxic. These are two steps that I would love to see the Delta-8 producers take, which, is, which are not being done. Uh, we've tested thousands of products, and as I said, we've never seen one without those byproducts. Right. Now, can you speak from, from a chemistry perspective, what kind of process does it actually take, or what kind of process are these producers doing in order to produce this? And, you know, here's where my concern lies, is, is in the fact that I know that hemp is a, is a phytoremediator. I know that it's pulling these things from the soils. We don't have any testing regulations around the extracts that are being produced from these hemps that are possibly contaminated from the very beginning. Now we're going to take them into a lab. We're going to add additional chemicals into these mixes. And we don't even know, you know, what we're starting with. So do you want to talk a little bit about that process and what that actually looks like and why it's so concerning that some of these products are hitting the market right now? Sure. The conversion of CBD to THC, it's a chemical synthesis, and so it involves some fairly toxic reagents. Uh, the first thing, people are typically going to start from a CBD isolate. Uh, they're going to dissolve that in an organic solvent, which has a certain amount of toxicity on its own right. And then they're going to add to that <clears throat> typically strong acids. They can also do it under basic conditions, but acid conditions are uh, the most common that we see. There's also potential for the use of catalysts, heavy metal catalysts in the reactions to facilitate the reaction. And so when this synthesis is done, the next step then is to remove these contaminants, remove the solvents, remove the residual heavy metals uh, or, or catalysts, uh, remove the acid or neutralize it. And so some of these steps are very complicated and uh, the question I have is how adept are the producers at removing these reagents, these, these processing reagents from a final product? And then Who's testing for these? Very rarely do we ever get a sample submitted to us that's Delta-8 that somebody has requested for heavy metals or some of these solvents. And so not only do we not know if these producers are capable of removing these contaminants, but most people aren't even testing for them. When I go to a conference or to a trade show and I see these Delta-8 products being marketed and I ask them about contaminant testing, they show me the pesticide screen that they've tested it for pesticides. And my response is pesticides are for agricultural products. These are no longer agricultural products. As soon as you dissolved it in organic solvent and started adding uh, very acidic reagents and catalysts, this is a synthetic process, a synthetic product, not an agricultural product. So a pesticide screen is, is completely meaningless to me when I look at these products. Right. Right. And, you know, from the same token, I think one of the things that really strikes me, especially like you talked about at these expos um, where, where there's a lot of the Delta 8 products or Delta 10. Now we're seeing THCO and HHC and there's all of these new synthesized cannabinoids that are hitting the market. And it, it, it just 
my concern is, is, you know, we started this industry from a perspective of compassionate care, people wanting a natural, you know, plant-based um, alternative maybe to, to the side effects that they were getting from another pharmaceutical. And now we're taking that same plant and we're turning it back into a pharmaceutical. <laughs> and, and it just, you know, and like you said, it just doesn't go through the same checks and balances that other pharmaceutical or synthesized products should go through. And a lot of these products are being marketed as natural and they're being marketed as safe and they're being marketed as legal because they're being produced from, from hemp. And I just feel like there is a disconnect between how these products are being marketed and how they're being produced and then how they're being perceived by the consumer in the middle. Yeah, it, it's a crazy world. I mean, we certainly have veered off the rails from where the intended, the history or the roots of the cannabis industry started from and the advances that we've made. Um, a lot of these products that are, that are being created now, I even see THCP or THCPO, uh, HHCO, the acetate form of these. There's very little known on the toxicity of them. There's very little known about how to appropriately dose them. Uh, THCP is significantly more psychoactive than, than Delta-9 THC. Uh, when that's acetylated to make the THCPO, uh, it's going to be incredibly psychoactive. And so uh, I've already seen several uh, reports of people who have had really bad experiences because they just they dose it like they would dose THC. Again, when I see these products in the marketplace, I see them uh, at expositions, and when I talk to consumers who are purchasing them, oftentimes they don't even know what's in them. They don't even know that there's THC. They see the Delta-8, the Delta-8 gummies. Well, what does that mean to a consumer? The Delta is the Greek symbol for the triangle is the Greek symbol for Delta. And so I've even talked to customers uh, who, who are talking about Triangle 8. What's Triangle 8? Well, it's not Triangle 8, it's Delta 8 THC. It is THC. It can be psychoactive. So they're being marketed irresponsibly, first of all. And that's just the, the marketing of the Delta 8. Very few people are addressing these contaminants, both the, the uh, residual reagents that are in them, the potential synthetic byproducts, and then the isomers of, of THC. So the first time I saw Delta 10 THC gummies coming through our lab, my initial response was, how cool is this? People are thinking outside the box. This is fantastic. We got a Delta 10 gummy. But I went to the literature and I said, what do we know about the toxicity of Delta 10 THC? And I've asked many people what the toxicity is, and nobody knows what it is because it hasn't been studied yet. There's no toxicity information that I've been able to find on the toxicity of Delta-10 THC. Now, that being said, the majority of the Delta-10 THC products in the market are not even Delta-10. They're Delta-6A10A, which is yet another isomer of THC, not even the right one. So these people are just making, making stuff up. Well, and you know, so that actually brings up another great point that I wanted to talk about. Even, even in a lot of these cases where the product, you know, is showing test results, the truth of the matter is, is that a lot of the labs really cannot tell the difference between Delta eight or Delta nine or Delta 10. And, and there, and I, I've heard these horror stories of, of people lab shopping and getting the results that they want because they go and they shop around for the right lab that's going to give them what they need. And so we do come back to that, um, that notion that the consumers really have no idea, you know, they cannot rely on those labels. They cannot rely on what they're purchasing. And so for me, purchasing one of these synthetic products is a little like playing Russian roulette. You just do not know what you're getting with each and every batch. Absolutely. Almost every lab that is providing testing for these, including our own, use a, a method called HPLC or high, high pressure liquid chromatography. The methods that we use were designed and optimized and validated for phytocannabinoids. That's the cannabinoids that are produced by the cannabis plant. Those methods are not appropriate for synthetic cannabinoids. So if I'm dealing with phytocannabinoids, I can tell the difference between Delta-9 and Delta-8. But if I have 20 different THC isomers in a product, I can no longer distinguish between them. And so the methods that are being used uh, are not capable of detecting Delta-9. I would say that every Delta-8 vape cartridge on the market 
has uh, Delta 9 at levels that are outside of compliance. They're typically at 6% uh, THC, Delta 9 THC. But the lab reports that come with it say none detected. Well, that's, that's just laboratory incompetence at that point. Right. Right. Now, something I want to touch on, and, and you and I talked about this at the NOCO Hemp Expo this year, and, and I would love to, you know, put up the, the graphic that you showed me when we were talking at your booth. Um, the, the peaks that you're finding in a lot of these products and the question marks that are there, would you mind, you know, just discussing a little bit of what you're finding and, and kind of some of that unknown that, that we just don't realize, you know, what What's being caused by these chemical reactions during these processes? That's that's the $20 million question. So a lot of these compounds that we're seeing, we have evidence that they're there. We know pieces of information about them, but many of these are novel compounds, meaning they have never been identified before. So as such, they have no name. I don't even know what to call them. I often describe it to people who are non-chemists is if you go out on a night on the town and you come home and your house has been broken into, your TV's missing, your stereo's missing, your jewelry's missing, you can see shoe prints on the carpet, there's fingerprints on the window, but you don't know who it was. You don't know who broke into your house. And so you run, the police come and they run those fingerprints from the window across a database and they don't come up with any hits. It doesn't mean that your house was not robbed. It just means there's not enough pieces of information to identify uh, who broke into your house. These chemical constituents that we see are very similar. We know the molecular weight of them. We can see the UV spectral absorbance of these compounds. So I know they're there. I know that they are not natural in the cannabis plant. I know that they are not being hit when I search those uh, specifics across a national chemistry database library. So these are not coming up as, as hits in that database. Um, so we don't know a lot about what is there. In some cases, we know that these compounds can be chlorinated. They have somehow a chlorine molecule added to the, to the compound. Uh, so in general, chlorine is not considered healthy. And so when you add that chlorine atom to that molecule, uh, there's potential for toxicity there. And so we have all these pieces of information, but not really enough to uh, give them an identity or call them out. I, I believe uh, Proverty is the only laboratory that I know of that actually puts a warning when we provide testing results for these compounds that because of the unknown toxicity of these compounds, these would not be recommended for human consumption. We, do, we don't know that they're toxic, but we also don't know that they don't create birth defects. They don't create cancer. Uh, we just have no idea. Exactly. And that's one point that I love to try to to make is that, you know, there, there's a lot of unknown things in, in a, a lot of the things that we eat on a daily basis or things that we consume. There's there's unknown things to us, at least to us as as general consumers in the lotions and things that we put on our skin. And we, we do go about buying these products with a certain level of trust in the manufacturer that they're putting things in there that are going to be okay for us to consume. But one of the things that you pointed out to me when, when we were talking at the expo was that with these unknowns, we don't know, you know, it may not, it may not hurt you right now, today, after consuming this product, but who's to say that that molecule or that, that one thing that was in that product isn't the birthplace of some cancer that you're going to get in say 10 years or something that's gonna show up in your health record down the road. And those are the kinds of unknowns that really make these products for me, you know, um, it, very, I don't know, I, I just feel very uncomfortable putting that level of trust into companies that are not concerned about the products that they're really putting on the market for consumers. Yes, if you look at almost every other consumer product, there is somebody watching over that, whether it's the uh, USDA for meats, whether it's uh, for dairy, uh, the FDA for pharmaceutical products. Uh, no matter what we put in or on our bodies is typically screened or, or under some regulatory uh, oversight to make sure that consumers aren't being subjected to contaminants. And yet it still happens. We see recalls due to salmonella. We see people getting sick from products. 
uh, we see contaminants. Uh, there was a case where pet food was had some mycotoxins in it and it was killing people's pets. So even though there's this regulatory oversight in almost all these industries, oversight is not 100%. It's, it's viewed as uh, trying to protect the, the best interests of the consumers, but even under that regulatory oversight, things happen, things slip through the cracks and people get hurt. This is a new, this is a new area where there is literally no oversight. It is legally not, it, it's not illegal to poison people with these products. There's nobody saying you can't poison people. Right. And that's where my fear, I think, comes in with these products is that I feel like it's just going to take that one incident. It's going to take that one product that really causes, uh, you know, an issue or that one bad batch, I guess, is what I'm looking for from a producer who may have done things correctly, you know, multiple times. But because there is no regulation, one one slip up in his process or one mistake in that process, and maybe it puts something, you know, more more toxic in there and really causes an issue and i feel like that's just going to be a black eye on everybody when that actually happens and but like you said nobody likes regulation we we know that they're there for a reason nobody likes it and it's it's something that we hear all the time is that we don't want to over regulate the industry but then where's that sweet spot how do we actually start to address these problems without making the smaller producers feel like they have to become big business to be able to afford to even work in the industry. So just backing up a bit about uh, that first case where it's going to where somebody gets hurt. It's already too late. There's already been uh, the CDC has tracked some 660 cases of adverse events where people have end up hospitalized because of consumption of these products. A significant portion of them are children because these products are being marketed uh, with very little oversight so you, you don't need a, a driver's license to purchase these products on the internet and so that first case is, is long past we've already seen people who have had some pretty serious consequences from consumption of these products and again it's not the delta eight uh, even the discussions with the fda and some of the publications that the fda and the cdc have issued their concern is not about the delta eight as much as it is the contaminants that are found in these products from being produced in an unregulated environment. And so different states are choosing to deal with this in different ways. Many states are just choosing to outlaw the Delta-8 or the synthetic transformations. Um, I don't know if that's the right approach, but what is the right approach? And, and I don't have an answer for that because in some states where they are permitting these conversions from CBD to other uh, synthetic cannabinoids, they want the laboratories to test to make sure that these are free from contaminants. But as I said before, we don't have methods yet to detect these contaminants uh, under traditional testing methodologies. Does it feel a little bit like, uh, I feel like we're watching a, a the production of a pharmaceutical in real time. You know, we're, we're getting, the, the product is being produced, but we're not going through any of the testing. We're not going through any of the, you know, safety precautions. We're not looking, and, and we're watching this kind of play out as, as, you know, 15, 10, 15 years of research would in a pharmaceutical realm, but at, a, at an unfettered, unregulated, you know, here, let's just throw it out to the consumer and see what happens kind of way. <laughs> Yeah. Um, when I, I said before that we've tested thousands of these products and never have seen one without these contaminants, that's not actually a true statement. We actually have tested one product, but it was a product that we worked with uh, an instrument manufacturer to show that you can clean up Delta-8, that you can take these synthetic Delta-8 mixtures and remove the contaminants. And so I've shown in, in many presentations I've given all over the country on the topic, I've shown that it can be done. And what surprises me is I will rarely, I think it's only happened once, where anyone has come to me after this presentation and said, how did they do it? Who did you work with? What kind of equipment does it take? Nobody cares. They, the producers, in my opinion, when I've talked to them, they all feign concern, but at the end of the day, they just go to a, a lab who's not gonna report those, those contaminants in their product and they, they in large part, at least I haven't seen it, they haven't changed their processes 
and they're still producing these products that are heavily contaminated with these unknown, uh, their unknown toxicity compounds. And that for me is probably the most disappointing part of what I've seen as, as the industry has evolved, is that through the production of these Delta 8 and these synthetic THC products, I feel like the industry has simply proven that when there is a profit involved, that we will choose the higher profit over consumer safety when it's allowed to happen. You know, there's, there's those profiteers out there that just take no concern. And if it's going to be allowed, they're going to cut every corner that they can regardless because there's nothing telling them that they can't. And that's where, you know, I, that's where I become then that, that proponent for regulation, because I think we have to have some, at least some production standards, some testing standards, maybe some labeling standards put into place for these consumer, consumer products. Um, and, and not to the point to where it becomes difficult to do business. Obviously the cannabis industry has already proven that give us your regulations, we'll figure out how to meet those regulations and we'll do so you know, uh, appropriately. And I think that the hemp industry is going to have to go through a similar shift with these consumable products as well. Yeah, um, I was just shopping on Amazon the other day and we do a lot of testing for people who are selling CBD products on Amazon. So I know they're very strict on their policies for labeling and, and contents. And I saw a product on there called Extract 8 Delta Hemp Gummies. There was nowhere on there on the bottle did it say THC. Nowhere in their advertisement did they claim that there was any psychoactivity. And so by leaving off the THC, they were able to get it past the Amazon, whoever reviews Amazon postings to get it sold on their product. Um, I was able to purchase that, that gummy without any any oversight there was no age verification if i was 12 years old and had a credit card i could have purchased that um, that's that's disturbing that is very disturbing and and you know as so what and what i can say and this is one of the reasons why this topic is so near and dear to my heart and why i talk about it a lot is uh, you know, I, I have been a cannabis advocate. Uh, my husband and I are both cannabis patients. We've, we've seen the benefit that can come from uh, learning how to use these products appropriately. And what, what really kind of frightens me is that as coming at it from a health perspective, the last thing I want to do is take a product that could impede my health. And, and I, I've tried a few of these Delta 8 products. I've tried them from different companies. I've tried them from, you know, in different formats. And I've never had a good experience. Uh, it, it's one of them, in fact, made me so violently ill. I was begging for death because it was the, the pain it was, was so ridiculous that it was unbearable. And, and so that's one of the reasons why I know that something can go wrong in production is because I've personally experienced this. I knew it wasn't the Delta 8 that was making me sick, but I knew that there was something in this product that, that wasn't right. And so, you know, when you talk about the, the cases that have been reported to the CDC, there was recently a news article out of the UK. And of course it hasn't been confirmed, but a woman had eaten a, a synthetic cannabis sweet is what they're calling it. And, and, died a few hours later, you know, and, and we don't know why. We don't know if, like we said, we don't know if it's a contaminant in that. We don't know if she had a health condition that reacted from something that she ate there, or if it was just something completely unrelated and just a coincidence. We don't know, but it's these stories and it's the, the, the stories that we're hearing from so many people that are having bad reactions to these products. And, and I feel like we have to tell these stories so then we can improve these products and make sure that they're safe for the people that are consuming them. Yeah, unfortunately, a lot of people don't don't want to hear it. So they, I, I meet a lot of people who consume Delta 8 products on a regular basis, and the majority of them have positive experiences, at least that they report to me. There are some serious cases uh, where people have been harmed by them. Um, I have one client who uh, was actually in a long-term care facility because she had purchased and consumed a, a product that was Delta 8, that it was a vape pen that had been mixed with vitamin E acetate. So if you remember a couple years ago, CDC got involved in the E Valley where producers were putting vitamin E acetate in these vape cartridges. Now when that first occurred, 
I don't think there was any malintent. Somebody was just trying to, vitamin E, who doesn't love vitamin E? It just doesn't belong in your lungs. But I believe that the first people who were making those products had no malice intent in their production. But today we know better. Today we know people die from that and people are still today mixing vitamin E acetate with Delta ATHC and selling it as a Delta 9 THC vape product. And people are buying these and it's having a negative impact in their life. She was in the ICU for 10 days. Um, Pretty serious stuff. Right, right. And I'm so glad that you brought that up because we did talk about that too. And, and you know, that's, that's another thing. I, I think that's just another point to what I was saying about, you know, today, like you said, we know that vitamin E acetate is not good on the lungs. So for me, if someone using that in a product that they're selling just says to me that they're, they're only looking out for that bottom dollar and they're not looking out for the consumer experience or consumer safety. And the last, you know, I, I hear so many people say, well, the, the bad producers are going to weed themselves out because consumers are going to start to get smart. Well, how many people have to get sick or hurt while we wait for that process to happen? You know, so, I mean, regulation is necessary, I think, in these cases where you have people that are consuming a product that they're expecting a certain uh, effect from when you have to know what's in those products, you know, consumers need to know. And, and I understand, and this is another argument I hear as a, as a journalist all the time is that, well, people have been using cannabis for years and it's never hurt anybody, but today is a little different. You know, it's, it's, it's a little different when we're talking about lab processes and chemical conversions and, and all of these, you know, different extraction processes and residual chemicals and phytoremediation, pulling heavy metals out of the soil. You know, we have to know these things. Yeah. It still is, it frustrates me that, you know, a lot of the rationale behind the, the, these products, and I don't disagree with it, is the federal prohibition of, of cannabis. So these Delta-8 products are extremely popular in states where marijuana is not legal. So I get the, I get the conundrum. Um, I think that federal uh, changes in federal policy would go a long way to correcting this. So right now we have state by state by state who are outlawing Delta-8 or or other psychoactive uh, conversions from CBD. Um, I hate to see it go that path taking Delta-8 away from uh, potential therapeutic applications is the wrong approach. Um, rather than taking a you know potential therapeutic away from people, um, I would like to see certainly federal uh, changes in the policy would be go a long way if, if marijuana was just legalized. Um, that would probably do a lot to put some of these bad actors out of business. Right. Right. I completely agree 100%. And, you know, I, I feel like <clears throat> I feel like it's a matter of time. Uh, unfortunately, I, I feel like it's going to take a few more of these incidences of people getting sick, of people getting hurt um, before we really see that that change come. And I, I agree with you completely. I think if we saw maybe an across the board federal change on our approach to cannabis, that maybe the Delta 8 products and the synthetics would have less of a market because people then would be able to get a hold of the true phytocannabinoid that is that is, you know, brought from a plant and in a in a regulated environment where we know how it's being produced. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think that's really kind of the best answer for all of this stuff is to put it in, a, in an environment where we know how it's being produced and what's in it. And and we have at least some safeguards put into place to make sure that consumers are getting what they expect. So, I mean, even on the flip side, you know, there's so many products out there now that say that they have these cannabinoids in them, but when they're tested, they really don't. <laughs> So I think that, you know, all the way around, consumers need to know what are in these products. Absolutely. So talk to me a little bit before we sign off here. I would love to have you talk about Pro Verde and the the services that you offer um, in, in terms of helping these producers make sure that they are putting out a good quality product and making sure that their processes and the things that they're doing are are up to par for putting out a a consumable product that people are depending on 
Sure. So we've been working with with all aspects of the industry, from the cultivators of, of cannabis and hemp, uh, people who are doing extractions. We help them optimize their processes, doing formulations, uh, and so we've worked with a lot of different sectors within the the industry. Um, we have a really keen focus on R and D projects for customer formulation, especially with uh, like nano emulsions, which are beverages are a big thing right now. Um, and when we do see these Delta-8 products coming through our lab, uh, we do put on our certificates of analysis and, and we will have discussions with our consumers, or with our, with our clients about the potential harm for these products. And we're very happy to provide some level of guidance into where they can get information on how to clean these products up. We don't actually do that ourselves. We don't sell any instrumentation or methods, um, but I can certainly provide guidance to people who are doing these. And unfortunately, I don't see that going anywhere. Very few people are interested. Again, it, it reduces the margins on these products because it takes extra work. And with nobody overseeing the production of these, um, there's only so much I can do as a laboratory. I can, I can inform people what's there. I can give them alternative processes, but I can't make them follow those processes. I can't make them uh, remove the contaminants from their products. Right. Well, let's hope that they want to. <laughs> let's hope that they want to produce a good quality product that has staying power and that they're not just trying to capitalize on the wild, wild west that we see happening in this industry right now. Because I feel like there are a lot of producers out, now, out there right now that are really trying to take advantage of the lack of regulation that's happening. That's unfortunate, but yes, that is the situation. Well, Chris, it has been absolutely phenomenal to have you here on my show. And I want to um, make sure that we have you back again, or at least maybe have you in for another conversation, because I would love to talk to you more in depth about um, these processes that you're talking about to clean up the Delta 8 products. Because obviously, if there's a way to get it done, we need to educate the manufacturers out there on on how to do it. So then, then we can start putting a little faith and trust in some of these products that we're seeing hit the market. And, and good quality producers you know, can start to put their their stamp on these products and say you know we've gone through this process we know that they're contaminant free and and i think that's what both you know the consumer the labs the you know the the safety uh, regulatory bodies that kind of stuff i think that's what they want to see happen is that these producers really do want to put out a good safe product so let's definitely have you back and we'll talk more about those processes but again chris thanks so much for coming on here and talking about this ever so important topic my pleasure. Thank you for having me on.